No, don't stop till you get enough. And you haven't had enough. <laughs> no way. No way. What's good, you two? What's good? It's your boy Nick, man, and I'm back with another video as you can see. And before we get started, if this is your first time on my channel, make sure you guys click that like button. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and don't forget to turn those post notifications on so you'll be alert when I do make new videos. It'll, it'll help me, but it will also help the algorithm of YouTube as well, you know what I'm saying, for my videos to surface around. And I would really appreciate it, you know what I'm saying. And check out the last video I did, you know what I'm saying. If you got time, you know what I'm saying, no big rush. But uh, I really appreciate you guys check out the last video I did. So today we're about to be watching Michael Jackson and Jermaine Jackson's battle for solo success. You know what I'm saying? But without further ado, man, let's cut the chase and get straight into it, man. Let's go. Siblings, sounds like it could be the best thing in the world. But in reality, it could be an absolute nightmare. While their chemistry outwardly looked pleasant during their time in the Jackson 5, these performing brothers soon developed a sibling rivalry that became especially fierce years after the group's Motown heyday. That rivalry being between Michael Jackson and his older brother Jermaine. <laughs> Making it alone. Making it alone. The Jackson 5's exodus suits. to Epic Records wasn't just hard for like Jermaine, but was also a tough man. pill for Motown to <laughs> swallow. The Detroit record company that managed the careers of the most popular black music artists of the 60s was now experiencing a serious downturn, and the Jacksons weren't the only part to play in that. By 1975, the Spinners had left Motown and found great success. Gladys Knight and the Pips left and also experienced a career resurgence, and longtime Motown producers like Lamont Dozier had also made their exit. Diana Ross, The Temptations, and The Miracles, all of whom remained on the label, were beginning to appear as Old Hat. Only Stevie Wonder and the Jackson 5, the last successful act they developed, continued to push an image of Motown as a commercially viable entity at the more cutting edge of popular music. Once visionaries that made stars out of kids from Detroit's Brewster projects, they were seen as no longer catapulting careers, but holding their talent captive by nefarious contracts. Quote, we left Motown because we look forward to selling a lot of albums. Motown sells a lot of singles. Epic sells a lot of albums. Mm. Brother Tito Jackson stated in a 1975 press conference announcing their departure from Motown. In light of a statement like this, Barry Gordy responded by stepping it up a notch to demonstrate that the Jackson family's presumption was unfounded and that their departure would ultimately prove to be a grave mistake. With his son-in-law, the last Jackson remaining, Gordy hired a who's who of Motown producers. This included Hal Davis, who was instrumental in the Jackson 5's early success, and Jeffrey Bowen to develop Jermaine's next record, which its mission was to launch his adult solo career. 1970s major hit makers like Barry White were even in talks with Barry Gordy to Barry help with White, the album. White confirming in a 1975 interview, quote, There's a strong possibility that I might even produce Jermaine Jackson in the future, and I can dig that. Barry's got every step of Jermaine's career mapped out, and it's just a matter of executing the program. When in the past, brotherly competition played out in fan magazines while Jermaine was still in the Jackson 5, now it was featured in national press as both Jermaine and the Jacksons battled it out in the charts. Oh. Jermaine's record label well, even got in on the act, okay. Motown releasing Joyful Jukebox Music, an album of previously unreleased tracks by the Jackson 5, recorded a year before they switched labels. The record was stocked on music store shelves mere weeks before the newly formed Jacksons were to release their much-anticipated debut at Epic. A wow. clear attempt to confuse the record-buying public, or at least spread the allowances of fans, so to diminish the Jacksons' first week record sales and put money back in Motown's pocket. Emotions got the best of them during this period of change, but the hardest feelings were not so much among the brothers as with the public, who looked at Jermaine as something of a traitor. Quote, we would be playing basketball together, and people would come up to get their autographs, but they wouldn't ask for mine, because they would say, oh no, we don't want your autograph, because you left your brothers. Ooh. Motown soon began heavy promotion for Jermaine's first album I since leaving the group, 1976's My Name is Jermaine, which featured the futuristic bass odyssey, Let's Be Young Tonight, and the ballad My Touch of Madness. 
However, the record didn't rip through the charts as Motown had hoped, with its lead single peaking on the Billboard Hot 100 at a disappointing 55. Whoa. What came next was Feel the Fire, 55. a record released a year later in 1977 and ranked even lower than its predecessor. Followed by the uncharting Frontiers less than a year later, which included two Stevie Wonder cover songs. Namely, Isn't She Lovely and I Love Every Little Thing About You. Although Jermaine's first three records post the Jackson 5 didn't propel his career forward as he and Motown hoped, the Stevie Wonder connection he developed continued, resulting in Jermaine enlisting the aid of his label mate to write and produce three of the tracks that would feature on his 1979 album, Let's Get Serious. This included the record's title track, which became Jackson's second top 10 pop hit and first number one single on the R&B chart, mm. edging out Brother Michael's platinum certified mega hit, Rock With You. Wow. Achieving both commercial and critical yes, success with the track, Jermaine was also nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Male R&B Vocal Performance. However, lost to his brother Michael, who secured his first Grammy for his performance on another 1979 smash hit of his, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. Brothers Reunited at this point, it felt that Jermaine and his brothers had finally hit their stride after the Jacksons secured a string of hits from their 1978 album, Destiny, and Michael's incredible solo success with Off the Wall. Oh, However, the public perception was that Jermaine had it the easiest because his father-in-law ran the recording company. Quote, But it was harder on me than it would have been on anybody else, he said when questioned. Quote, My father-in-law was tough on me, tougher than he was on anybody else. That being said, all that was needed from Jermaine was for him to do what he was told and trust the Motown machine that catapulted the Jackson 5 into superstardom in the first place. Quote, Sometimes you have to try a few recipes and experiment a little before you find the right combination of ingredients. It was the same way with my albums. I had to change ingredients and now I think I have it right. However, Jermaine was becoming increasingly frustrated and after so many unfulfilled dreams in the years since leaving his brothers, he feared his career wasn't building enough momentum to reach his ultimate goals. Quote, I haven't toured since the last show I did with my brothers in Las Vegas. I guess I feel I want to be more ready and have the product. I could have toured after Let's Get Serious, but my father-in-law told me, look, that's just one hit record. You've got to do it. And he was absolutely right. Yeah, However, right. having performed since you the age of can't. nine, I'll Jermaine felt possible. he was too long in the tooth at 26 to be constantly told that he needed to prove himself and work on his craft before achieving success. He had long paid his dues and should be reaping the benefits of his hard work like his brothers, performing arenas night after night around the world. After the disappointing release of the records I Like Your Style in 1981 and Let Me Tickle Your Fancy the following year, Jermaine finally fancy. began to plan his long-anticipated exit from Motown, who appeared to have run out of steam when it came to his career. Some kind of reunion with his brothers was also on the cards, although Jermaine was keen for it not to be as seen as him simply rejoining the band, or even worse, piggybacking off their recent success. Quote, We are planning to do one tour together, Jermaine said in a 1982 interview. Quote, And we may even do an album together, but no, it wouldn't be a permanent thing. I'm on my own for keeps. I like it this way. The Jackson Brothers reunion would come during a high-profile 1983 television special celebrating 25 years of unparalleled success and the enduring legacy of Motown, Motown 25. There, they were to perform a string of early Jackson 5 hits, and after, Michael was to appear on stage alone to do his own rendition of the latest single from his new record, Thriller. Although the televised event was billed as the Jackson Brothers Big Reunion, Michael Jackson's stellar performance of Billie Jean and his first introduction of his soon-to-be signature move, The Moonwalk, stole the show and was the focus of headlines the next morning. This performance marked the beginning of a colossal rise in popularity and hysteria that surrounded his brother Michael. From monster hits Billie Jean to Beat It and then Thriller, their heavily rotated videos on MTV introduced Jackson to a whole new generation of music buyers and the Gloved Ones album and single sales went off the charts. Michael Mania had truly taken over the nation and around the world. With Michael's star power at an all-time high and an increasingly anticipated tour with his brothers in the works, Jermaine was in the best of positions to secure a promising record contract outside of Motown. 
In June 1983, it was announced that after 14 years, Jermaine Jackson had left Motown Records and signed with Arista. It was a bold move to make, probably the biggest of his career, and the first time he would be able to prove he could make it on his own without being molded by a domineering fatherly presence. The Road to Victory Towards the end of 1983, during a New York press conference, boxing promoter Don King announced in grand fashion that the Jackson brothers were reuniting for a world tour that would start in summer of 1984. Accompanying the tour would also be a new Jackson's record, which will be their first as a group since 1976, tossing out figures like $5 million to $25 million. King said he expected it to be the most profitable pop music tour ever. The brothers had already secured a $5 million yeah, tour boy. sponsorship deal with Pepsi Cola, the largest corporate sponsorship deal in rock history. During the event, Jermaine Jackson said that the brothers for a long time wanted to work together again, particularly after being reunited at Motown 25. Although the tour had the Jacksons headlining, their success and popularity as a group had largely been eclipsed by the recent phenomenal success of Michael's solo work. With the Thriller album set to become the largest selling record of all time, many questioned why Michael would be back on stage with his brothers when a solo tour would be way more lucrative for the artist. There was no answer at the press conference, but Michael is said to have agreed to the tour because his family were so invested in it. It was a favor to them and a parting gift as he moved on to more solo projects. Although Michael's throat was said to be too tired to speak during the press conference, a release handed out beforehand had Michael clearly quoted as saying this will be the last tour. After this announcement, Jermaine spent the following months in the studio finishing up recording for his debut at Arista and an album that would introduce himself to a whole new global audience of prospective fans that Michael had previously captivated with Thriller. The record was simply titled Jermaine Jackson, or Dynamite internationally, and didn't deviate too far from the trending sounds of 80s pop giving them a slickly produced Jackson R&B edge. Stony-faced and poised in a velvet military-style jacket, what surprised many is that Jermaine didn't make much of an attempt to differentiate himself from his superstar brother. With many critics citing his latest output as poor imitations of Michael's more recent hits, its lead single, Dynamite, was a clear attempt at producing a dance-focused, MTV-friendly video epic in a similar vein to Michael's Beat It. While music critic Scott L. Miley noted that, quote, the construction of the silly escape from the planet of the Ant-Men might as well be a cheaper version of Thriller, and how about that opening bass line for his duet with Michael, Tell Me I'm Not Dreaming, which sounds a lot like the opener for Michael's Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. The album not only featured Brother Michael, but also Tito and Randy, as well as a then-unknown Whitney Houston and a sentimental ballad, Take Good Care of My Heart. Overall, the record sold well, reaching number one on the R&B charts and selling over half a million copies in the U.S. alone. Critics claimed it was a perfectly serviceable record, but if it weren't for the phenomenal popularity of his brother, there wouldn't have been nearly as much attention paid to the release of it. Although it made marketing sense to tap into the buzz around his brother, Michael's unparalleled talent and recent incredible chart success ultimately shrunk Jermaine's own perceived status. Instead of Jermaine being seen as a prominent star in his own right, in the public's mind, he was labeled the poor man's version of his much-celebrated superstar brother. However, this could all change as opening night for the Jacksons' victory tour approached. It was the first time Jermaine had toured in over eight years, and he was the only brother, aside from Michael, to secure a part of the show dedicated to his solo work. The no greater of an opportunity to build buzz and finally launch himself as a mainstream artist in his own right. Although the road to victory wasn't as smooth as he and his brothers would have hoped. If you enjoyed this, then check out the other Jackson family dynamics we have documented in previous videos. Links are in the description box below. Subscribe. Another interesting video. You know what I'm saying? But um, what I will say is that um, Jermaine, like... Jermaine stayed loyal to pretty much the label that discovered them, man. His brothers went on to go to Epic, you know what I'm saying? And I understand why they went to Epic because, like, they wanted, they wanted, like, more, like they said, they wanted to sell albums. And Motown was really good. All Motown did was really sell singles. But 
they wanted to sell albums and you know they wanted to do more songwriting more producing and stuff like that so they, that's when they went to epic and they did pretty well but jermaine stayed committed you know what i'm saying he really did but um I'm going to just end the video right here, man. You know what I'm saying, man? If you like this video, don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, man. And um, turn to have your post notifications on. You know what I'm saying? I've been your boy, Nick, and I'll see you in the next video, bro. Peace.